walked right next to us, but we couldn't see him. Can you believe it? He was actually the one that we were looking for and hoping for, but we couldn't see him. We thought he came to redeem us from Rome, but we were so wrong. He didn't meet our expectations because our expectations were too small. We could not see him because our hurt, because of our pain, it blinded us. The doubt, the disappointment, the discouragement was too much for us to bear. But the one walking with us began to help us see. He opened the scriptures and taught us and revealed that he was the one who bought us. We invited the stranger into our home and our hearts began to burn within. He took bread and blessed it. We were blessed because finally we could see the resurrected blessed one. He's the one that rose from the dead. And right in that moment, even though he disappeared from our sight, we could finally see him more clearly. Well, good morning, friends, and happy Easter. Come on in and grab a seat. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so honored by your presence, especially if it's your first time with us, maybe your first time in a long time, or if you're watching online, thanks for tuning in. Uh, happy Resurrection Sunday to everyone. You look amazing. Well, well done. Some of these people putting me to shame. Jackets, ties, man, I feel underdressed for the occasion today, but uh, grateful that you are here today. Uh, if it's your first time with us, man, thank you for taking a chance on us today. I know that uh, looking for a new church or going to a different church can be kind of awkward and difficult at times. Lots of questions. Uh, what time do they start? What time do they really start? How many corny jokes is the preacher going to tell? Where do I take the kids? Right, Where do I park? Lots of different things, but hopefully you feel at home today uh, in this place. Uh, and, and hopefully a couple of uh, glasses of the best lemonade you will ever have uh, will help in going along with those lines. Normally we have um, Tom's Coffee with us, but they had an accident a couple weeks ago, and so uh, Miss Emily, she is the one that owns the lemonade truck. She's actually a student at NMSU. She came to our rescue this week, so go and bless her and, uh, and double fist it if you have to, all right? Nothing says hallelujah, praise Jesus, like Arnold Palmer in one hand and Cherry Limeade in the other. Am I right or am I right? Uh, I know that many of you probably have a great lunch or a feast uh, ready at home, or maybe you have an Easter egg hunt ready at grandma's home, uh, so I'm not going to take up too much of your time today, but I want to share some thoughts as we wrap up a series that we've been in the last couple of weeks called Seeing Clearly, and in this series, we've been looking at the cross of Christ, and we've been looking at it from a couple of different perspectives, three perspectives, in fact. First was the enemies of Christ, the followers of Christ, and then the two thieves who were crucified next to Christ. And that first group was overjoyed when they looked at the cross. The second group was overwhelmed when they looked at the cross. And the guy who looked at the cross today, well, he was able to overcome everything he'd ever done wrong when he looked at the cross. So I'm so excited to tell you his story. Uh, there's no story quite like it. So let me pray for us real fast and we'll dive into God's word. Father, we are so excited about today and just what it means and what it represents. The fact that you defeated death through death and that somehow as you were dying, God, you were literally opening the door for us to experience life, life now and life forever. And so we just pray, like Jackson said, that we will lean into that, that we will be drawn closer to you in the life that only you can give. Make it so now. Speak to us and through me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but, but March is one of my favorite months in the entire year. Uh, it's not the longer days, although, although I do really enjoy that. It's not the budding plants, although I really do love that. It's not the change in weather, although I love that. It's, it's really for one reason and one reason only. It's called March Madness. Uh, that's why I love the month of March. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, this is the huge college basketball tournament that happens every year around this time, and I love everything about it. I mean, I love filling out my bracket, even though it's totally destroyed right now. I love trying to pick the upsets. But the thing I love the most about March Madness has to be the last second buzzer beaters. I mean, it's one thing to win a game. But it's another to win it with just a second left when nobody thought you were going to win it. Am I right? You're not as excited as I was hoped, so uh, watch this. Michigan needs a win for their NCAA tournament host. Gotta go, Mike. Good try to get it here with Walton. Peels out slips. Walton. Chapman hoists the three. Let's go, man! At the buzzer! Michigan wins! Here we go. Two to go. 
Trip to the Sweet 16. Katie's got it. Rises up. The shot. And it's good! It's good! Wisconsin has won it! Player of the year. Taking it right at Morgan. Right at Raymar Morgan. 6.6 left. Raymond Green finds Lucius for the win. He got it! Spartans move to the Sweet 16. Here they come up. up. One time out, they don't take it. Gets it in. Booker gets it off. Now about 20 more minutes of that, so we can just watch that the rest of the sermon if you'd like. But I'm hoping that the sermon is so good this morning, you will bum rush the stage after it's over. Like, ah, I'm amazing. But there's nothing like a buzzer beater, right? I mean, the last second victory. And believe it or not, there is actually a buzzer beater in the Bible. Let me read you the story found in Luke 23. Begins in verse 32 and says this. There were two other men, both criminals, who were also led out with Jesus to be executed that day. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the other criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what, what they're doing. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, well, just save yourself. There was written a notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Well, save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. And don't you, don't you fear God, he said. Since you're under the same sentence, we're punished justly. We're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. Then the thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now living in Las Cruces, we are probably more familiar with the image of the three crosses than any other group of people in the world. Would you agree? We see this all of the time. And this image, the three crosses, Las Cruces, is based off of what we just read in the gospel. See, Jesus was not the only one to be crucified on a cross. That happened for decades leading up to his death, but it also happened on the day of his death. He was not alone up on the cross. The Bible tells us that Jesus is crucified between two other criminals. Now, the Greek word here for criminals is kakurgas. It kind of means rebel rouser, evil doer. Think somebody from Albuquerque. All right, it's kind of like, <laughs> just kidding. I'm from Albuquerque. I'm not that evil, just a little bit. But most scholars would say a modern day translation of kakurgas would be terrorist. These two men are terrorists, and they're hanging next to Jesus. And most scholars believe that these two guys were, were part of a little, a little triad, if you will. They were associates of a man named Barabbas. Now, Barabbas is an evil man, and he's part of a, a Jewish faction known as the Zealots. And these guys were so fed up with Rome, they were so tired of being bullied by the empire and the emperor, that they were taking matters into their own hands. And they started killing Romans and, and political leaders. And so who better to put next to Christ than three, than two other criminals, I should say, right? Three menaces to society, all in different ways and, and all going about it, different methods, but three menaces, three crosses. But in the book of Matthew, another book that describes kind of the life and times, the teachings of Jesus, we read a slightly different version of this exact same story. It appears that at first, both of these criminals, both of these kakurgas were insulting Jesus. Look at the text, Matthew 27, 44. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified him also heaped insults, plural, on him. So the two thugs are, are hanging there next to Jesus. And if dying on the cross is not enough, they decide to kick a man when he's down. Don't we just love to do that? 
And so they're insulting him. They're mocking him. They're jeering him as they die right next to him. But then something changes. There, there's a shift between Matthew's account, both Kakurgas insulting Jesus, to Luke's account. One is not insulting him anymore. It's as if a light switch has been flipped on. And this other thief, he sees something. Something changes deep within him. He has a massive change of heart. Now, maybe you can relate. Maybe you've been in a situation where uh, somebody is poking fun at you. They're insulting you. They're pushing all your buttons. But then suddenly, in the next moment, they need something from you. Anybody ever been in a situation like that? Like you're thinking of that one friend, right? Your second cousin. He's like making fun of your team, making fun of who you cheer for, making fun of what you do, all this stuff. He's like, oh, man, I forgot my wallet. Hey, can you pay for lunch today? Or maybe it's like a coworker, right? Making fun of you for how hard you work. You kiss up to the boss like, bro, hey, could you work this Friday? I'm trying to go see somebody in concert. What a change of heart. They go from being one person in one moment to being somebody else in the other moment. And that's what happens on the cross. The two thieves are both hurling insults at Jesus, but then one stops insulting him and starts defending him. The one cross tells the other, man, shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. We're getting what we deserve. But this guy, the man on the middle cross, he hasn't done anything wrong. And I'm just amazed at what is happening here in this story. He goes from a place of mocking suddenly to a place of marveling. Why the shift? Why the change? What happened? Well, we don't know for sure. Maybe it was the anguish that he saw on the faces of Jesus' followers, his family and his friends. Right? This thief, this Kakurgas, he's dying alone. There's nobody there watching him die. Nobody cares that he's dying. But Jesus, he's surrounded with people throughout the entirety of the day. People are there weeping and moaning and praying and giving thanks to God. And this, this thief, he'd never seen a devotion like that. Maybe it was the strange supernatural things that happened throughout the day. The Bible tells us that there was three hours of darkness in the middle of the day on the Friday that Jesus was crucified. This thief had never seen the miraculous like that. Maybe it was the fact that Jesus asked the Father to forgive his enemies, the very ones that were nailing him to the cross. This man, this Kakurgas, he was hell-bent on killing his enemies, not going through hell for his enemies. Man, he'd never seen a mercy like that. Maybe it was the way that Jesus cared for other people. In the scripture, it tells us that he was finding a way for his mother to be cared for even after he was going to die, encouraging his disciples even though he was going to die. This disciple, man, he didn't even know where his mom was. His mom didn't even know where he was. He had never seen a love like this. Maybe it was watching the way Jesus died. He's not struggling. He's not fighting. He's surrendering his life. He's handing it over, whereas this Kakurgas, man, he is vengeful even in the last moment. Man, if I could get off of here, what I would do to you. Maybe it was the humility, something the thief had never seen. See, all of those things when combined, I'm going to call that God's grace. All those expressions, the love, the devotion, the miraculous, the mercy, all those things are God's grace. And from Matthew, when he's insulting Jesus, to Luke, when he's defending Jesus, the only thing that changed was he saw God's grace. He was gripped by it. And you can't help but be changed when you truly see God's grace. See, God's grace has always been that one thing, that cataclyptic moment that is designed to change you from seeing things one way to seeing things in a totally different way. Look at Romans 2.4. Do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, his forbearance, his patience, not realizing it's God's kindness that is intended to lead you to repentance, that is designed to change your life. It's his goodness, it's his grace, it's his kindness that changes us. And the thief on the cross had a front row seat to it, the unconditional, unfathomable, incomprehensible kindness and grace of God. In one minute, he's hurling insults. Man, you said you were a savior. Why don't you save yourself? Why don't you save us? And in the next minute, he's saying, save me. And he's not asking it in kind of a, a ridiculous, ridicule type way. He's asking it because he believes it is possible. He believes it is true. One moment he's angry and bitter and prideful. And the next he's humble and broken and repentant. One minute he's living in the regret of a wasted life. And in the next minute he's asking Jesus for eternal life. Man, what a change. What a shift. 
See, this man, it looks like he had always seen the world through prideful lenses, through angry lenses, through vengeful lenses. And suddenly when he sees Jesus, those lenses fall and he sees everything clearly. He says, man, this, this guy, this Jesus guy, he's done nothing wrong. He sees clearly the Christ is perfect. He's sinless without fault. This Jesus guy, he lived life the way it was supposed to be lived. He didn't cause problems. He brought solutions. He didn't hurt people. He healed people. He's perfect. So he sees Jesus clearly. He's the spotless lamb of God, the Bible says. But in addition to seeing him as perfect, he also sees him as a king. What does he say? Jesus, remember me as you come into what? Your kingdom. Jesus is the king of kings. See, all kings in this earth, when they die, well, so dies their kingdom. When you pass away, there goes your kingdom. Maybe on to your son if you're lucky, but if not, someone else is going to come and take it. Well, this thief is saying, Jesus, when you die, your kingdom doesn't come to an end. It continues on. It's like it's just beginning. Jesus, you are the one in charge of the next life, and so please, would you take me with you? He makes this bold ask, let me go to paradise. Think about this. This guy is moments away from his death, maybe seconds away from breathing his very last breath, and he has the audacity to ask Jesus for heaven. He has lived a sad life, a pathetic life. This is going to be an ugly and forgettable death, and he cries out to Jesus to take him to heaven. It's as if this man suddenly realizes the power behind Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced, Jesus, for our transgressions. He, Jesus, was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Jesus. And by Jesus' wounds, we are healed. And so right before the buzzer sounds, right before the game is over, right before this guy dies, what does he do? He throws up a Hail Mary. He throws up a buzzer beater. Man, please, a last shot at salvation. Remember me in your kingdom. <laughs> and the shot goes in. The man is promised eternal life. Look at how Jesus answers him. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And the crowd goes crazy. What? Well, the crowd should go crazy, but they don't. See, the church, the crowd, man, they don't like this story all that, that much. This, come on, Jesus, this just isn't fair. You're going to give this guy, this kakurgas, this thief, this, this thug, dude was probably a Patriots fan. <laughs> You're going to give him a one-way ticket to paradise? You're going to open up heaven for this dude? This is a bad dude. This is a hateful dude. This is an angry dude. This is a violent dude. But more than that, this dude never had to get dressed up and wake up early and go to church. Never. This guy never had to miss his team playing on Sunday night football to go to his small group. This guy never had to, had to you know, get up and put up with grumpy people at church. He never had to give his hard-earned money to the church. He never attended one of our discipleship classes. Dude was never even baptized. This guy can't even fold his hands to pray. All he did was throw up a last-second desperation plea. Lord, remember me when you get to paradise. In other words, Lord, save me. Jesus, save me from everything that I've ever done wrong and, and shield me from the consequences, the punishment of all of those things. Whatever is coming my way in the future, shield me from those things. He is so gripped by the grace of God that he cries out to God. That's what God's kindness is designed to do for us. See, when you realize how good God is in comparison to kind of how bad you are, let's be honest, right? When you realize how good God is in comparison to how bad you are, you can't help but reach out. You can't help but cry out. I mean, the people that scare me the most in this world, besides those who like cats, I'm like, what's up with that? <laughs> the people that scare me the most are those who will say, ah, I'm a pretty good person. Really? Can I talk to your spouse? Can I ask your kids? 
Can I speak with your employer or your employees? Can I ask your neighbors? You're a pretty good person in comparison to who? Against whose standards? Because God demands perfection. God deserves perfection. Anything that's not perfect will not stand in God's sight. And so you're not to be upset by that. You're to reach out to God when you realize that. Look at the thief. At the end of his life, he realizes Jesus is so good that he might save someone who has been anything but. And Jesus confirms it. Sure, come on. Come on, he says. The last second shot is, is granted. And I can't help but think that the heavenly announcers, the angels, they were like, wait, 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 wait. The shot went in? That, that guy? Jesus, wow. But here's the thing, my friends, and we'll end with this. There were two criminals on crosses that day next to Jesus. And both were in great need. Both needed to be saved, but only one was. Now stay with me for a second. Why were there three crosses on that particular Friday? It's one of the most important Fridays, one of the most important historical events this world has ever seen. Why are there three crosses on that day? Why not ten? We're not 27. We're not 100. And why is Jesus, in all of the, in the, you know, the description of this story, why is he in the middle cross? Why isn't he on the left? Why isn't he on the right? Why aren't they on different hills, separated from each other? What's going on with this imagery and, and this symbolism? Could it be that God gave us lost crucis, the crosses, to symbolize the most important choice that all of us must make in this life? A choice between life and death. And it's your choice. See, the criminals have so much in common. They're convicted by the same system. They are condemned by the same, or to the same death. They're surrounded by the same crowd. They're hanging equally close to the same Christ. But only one is saved. Only one goes to paradise. Only one goes to heaven. I love talking about the last second buzzer beater of the thief. Ah! But don't you forget... The other man never shot the shot. He never took the chance. He never reached out to Jesus. It is so sad to me, so frustrating, as I've been wrestling with this story for the last couple of weeks. It was right there for him. Life now and life forever for this man. It was right there for him. The man in the middle cross was offering it, but he didn't take it. He didn't reach out and take it. Reminds me of a story I just heard a couple of weeks ago about a man who wanted to bless his entire family he wanted to give them their inheritance kind of before he passed away so he could enjoy it alongside of them. And so he decided to buy for all of his family, immediate as well as extended, all expense paid cruise around the Caribbean. And everybody said, Pastor Appreciation Month. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. 35 tickets, all expense paid. On the day of the trip, only seven people went with him. Seven people. That's it. Seven. See, some family members, they had some beef with this guy from years ago, and they had not let it go. So they said, no, I'm not going to go on a cruise with you. A few other people said, man, I got plans. I can't cancel those things. A few said, I have to work, and I can't get off. A few didn't like the cruise line he chose. All expense trip, paid in full, and only seven took advantage. And I can't help but think, this is how heaven works. This is how salvation works. Christ bought the ticket. Christ paid the price. He made all the arrangements. He took care of all the details. Christ knows where we're going. He knows exactly how to get there. But you have to believe in it. You have to ask for it. You have to reach out and take the ticket. That's what faith is. Faith is saying, Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. And I believe you bought paradise for me. You paid the price for paradise for me. And I'm going to take the ticket. I'll cancel all my other plans. I'm not going to go anywhere in this life. And I'm definitely not going anywhere after this life without you, Jesus. So I'm going to take the ticket. That's what the thief did. That's what I want us to do. So how does Easter play into all this? I know what some of you might be thinking is like, Pastor, bro, like, did you get the memo? 
Uh, today's Easter Sunday. Why so much talk about the cross? Yes, I got the memo. I sent the memo out, okay? Easter matters. The empty tomb matters because it provides proof for everything Jesus promised. The cross is proof that everything he promised came true. The empty tomb proves he is perfect. The empty tomb proves he is the king of kings. The empty tomb proves he is a ruler over an eternal kingdom. The empty tomb proves paradise is real. The empty tomb proves Jesus has the keys to it. The empty tomb proves there is life after death. The empty tomb proves it is finished. The empty tomb proves the ticket's been paid for. The empty tomb proves it all. And so Easter, I told the church this last Sunday, Easter is the victory parade that we get to celebrate today because of what God did on the cross. And you've seen those victory parades, right? People get crazy. People take their shirts off, go, I'm going to keep my shirt on for you today, all right? But this is our victory parade. This is it. We won. God won. Psalm 22, he did it. He did it. But like the thief on the cross, if you want to experience the wonder of that truth, you have to reach out in faith. I can't do it for you. Your parents can't do it for you. Your spouse who comes by themselves every single week, they can't do it for you. You've got to take the ticket yourself. And I don't want you to take the ticket only thinking about life eternal. You take the ticket for life right now. You see, grace through faith is what the Bible describes as how we live. And it's not just how we live at the end of our life. It's how we live every day of our life. We lean into God's grace. We lean into his kindness through faith. I know that so many of you are dealing with some really heavy things right now. And my heart breaks that you are going through those things. But the only way you're going to get past those things, to get over those things, is by leaning into God's grace through faith. Lean into God's kindness. Believe he is who he said he is. Take him up on his promises. Do that now in any situation that you're in. From from finding a spouse to not killing your spouse. From having a child to, God forbid, burying a child. From trying to figure out, what am I supposed to do in this life? To stopping yourself from buying a red sports car halfway through this life. It's grace. You lean into God's grace through faith. You see, things like disease and depression and divorce, they're all different forms of death. And the only way you get over death, get past death, get through death, is to reach out to Jesus and say, Jesus, save me. Take me to paradise now. Take me to paradise later. Help me to experience the life that you died to give. So let me end by kind of walking you through. This is not in the Bible, but just let's have some fun for a minute. What was it like for the thief the moment he made it to heaven? The second he breathes his last on the cross. Let's say, like any good preacher joke, he's meted by a group of angels at the gates. The angels start to ask him some questions. Well, hello, good sir. Welcome to heaven. Good sir, he says. Now, you don't, you don't know who I am, do you? And where am I? Oh, we love your humility, the angels say. Oh, how long have you been a Christian? A what? The guy says. Okay, okay. When did you invite Jesus into your heart? When did you say the sinner's prayer? When did you get baptized? The sinner's what? The guy says. Get what? Okay, well, you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, right? The immutability of God. Man, I don't have a clue what you people are talking about. The thief says, well, how in the world did you get to heaven? And the thief says, the man on the middle cross said, I could come. The man on the middle cross said, I could be here. The man on the middle cross gave me a ticket to this place, and I took him up on it. It was the man on the middle cross. That's the only answer he had, isn't it? That's the only answer I have. It's the only answer you have. 
But it's the best answer there is. The man on the middle cross said, you can go. The last day of this dude's life was the best day of his life. You don't have to wait that long. (laughs) Please don't wait that long. Eternal life, life now and life forever is available to us right now. Don't say it in your dying breath. Say it in your next breath. Jesus is the life. He doesn't offer us life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when you have a relationship with Jesus, when you're connected to Jesus, you always get life. That's kind of what Jesus always brings to the party. It's like, oh, Jesus is here. Oh, great, life is here. He always brings life. That's just who he is. So when you have a relationship with him, you will always have life. So instead of throwing up a last second prayer, say it now. Ask Jesus for life right now while there's still some time left. Ask for paradise in this, on this side of the grave, but also after the grave. Live in light of the eternal life that is ours in Jesus. See, a couple of weeks ago, my family and I got to go take a, a trip for spring break. We were super excited about it. And for months leading up to that trip, the girls, like, they were just talking about it. My three daughters, they were excited. Oh, we can't wait for the trip. Can't wait for the trip. Well, the trip was weeks away. But they were so looking forward to what was to come that it changed the way that they interacted with each other and with me. They were super nice for those few weeks. <laughs> it changed everything. Would you live in light of the paradise that is yet to come, and would it change everything about the way you're living right now? So don't wait until the end. Reach out to the man on the middle cross this morning. And I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to do that. We're going to end our time by uh, taking communion together. And for some of you who might be new to church or new to this church, this might be very new to you. We call it the Lord's table. It's kind of a little table. and There's two elements on the table. There's these little crackers. They're gluten-free, by the way. Little crackers, and they represent Jesus' body. So like that bread, that, that body was prepared for us. It was blessed for us, and then it was broken for us, very literally, on the cross. And so we come to the table, and we, we eat that little piece of bread. And then there's a bunch of little cups of juice, uh, red grape juice, kind of representing Jesus' blood, shed for us on the cross, in, in a very literal way, Right? And so these two elements, what they do for us every single week, and it's why we come to the table every week, we remember the man on the middle cross. We remember what he said. We remember what he promised. We remember what he did. But in addition to the elements on the table this morning, I have something else. And this might be super cheesy, but I spent hours on this, so just go with it, okay? There's a little ticket. It's a cruise line ticket. It's your ticket to paradise. And when you come to the table this morning, I want you to take the ticket. Because in coming to the table, in coming to the man in the middle cross, that's what we're saying. In faith, it's Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. And if you've never kind of given Jesus your heart in an official capacity, if you, if you don't know if there's a moment in your life where you, where you ever said that, on the back of that ticket is the thief's prayer. Jesus, save me. Save me from everything I've ever done wrong in the past. Shield me from anything coming to me that's negative and ugly and death in the future. And take me to be where you are. And so would you take the ticket this morning. Take communion. Remember the man in the middle cross. And then take the ticket. It's your ticket to life now. And life forever. So I'm going to pray that over us. And then I want you to come. Come to the table. Everyone is welcome. The man on the middle cross said you could come. So come on. Let's pray. Father, this is such a wonderful day, but it's not just a single day that we experience life. It's a day that ushers in a new way to live life. And so would we come to the man in the middle cross this morning? Would we remember that the suffering and the pain and the anguish and the heartache that he endured for us but would we take the ticket that he was buying for us in that moment? And today on Resurrection Sunday, would we realize, man, is this too good to be true? Is Jesus who, is he really perfect? Will Jesus take me to heaven? Will he forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong? How can I know? How can I trust this? The empty tomb. The empty tomb proves everything Jesus promised is real and right. We are loved. We are forgiven. We are redeemed, and one day we will be resurrected. 
And so we come to you this morning thanking you, Jesus, the man on the middle cross, for not only doing what you did, but for inviting me into it as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Come to the table. Come take the ticket.